Today I'd like to introduce our um, Robson Sales Yards uh, Assistant Manager, Brad Hale. Um, Brad is a, a major source of expertise and experience here. Basically, any question I ever have, he's got the answer, so you're in great hands today. Um, as, a, as I said, the seminar today is Don't Be Bug Me uh, about uh, pests in the garden and what you can do to uh, just eradicate them. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to pass you over to Brad. You're in great hands and then just enjoy the seminar. Take care. Thanks, Doug. Good morning. Pesticide laws came into effect 15 years ago and a lot of the good products that we had were banned by the provincial government so the politicians in Toronto decided to do away with what the scientists in Ottawa gave us. We have to look at different ways, options of controlling pests in the garden and integrated pest management which is a really, really old way to look at how to manage pests has become popular again and this is really using all of the tools at our disposal to identify, control, uh, find out where the problems are and, and then how to treat them the best we can. Um, we're managing ecosystems, we're not just managing pests, we're creating plant health that allows a plant to become stronger and better able to uh, withstand a, an attack from a pest. Uh, we keep journals, we re records, because one year from the next things change a little bit uh, and there's a lot of problems that you have to get on early, so if you know that a uh, certain time of year there's a, a pest that comes into your garden and the, the best way to treat it is two weeks before you see it, then it's kind of up to us to make sure we keep a record and keep a journal of what we see and then you can review that and remind yourself what you have to do in the garden at certain times. Uh, threshold levels is another example where we know there's going to be pests in the garden. So on the average you have about a, a thousand insects in your backyard of which perhaps a hundred of them are destructive. And of those hundred destructive pests, sometimes the population is so low that you don't even see any damage that they cause. Uh, other times the population spikes and your trees are defoliated or can ultimately be d killed. The uh, management strategies we look at, biological, physical, cultural, mechanical, and then of course chemical. So, you know, are we mulching? Are we watering properly? Are we fertilizing? Uh, do we go and pick some of the bugs off if there's only a few. Those are kind of the things that we can look at to, um, uh, to control our pests. But another, and then the last stage is, again, you go back and evaluate. So what the strategies that we did, have they been effective? Uh, or do we have to try something different? So the, the IPM is really just a circle because it's always continuous. So you're inspecting your plant, seeing where the trouble is. You're identifying what is causing the problem. And uh, thanks to Google, we have all kinds of information at our fingertips. Uh, you're gonna monitor for damage thresholds. Again, evaluate your, your treatment options when you're done and, and take notes. And so next year you can be that much better. There'll be lots of questions, by the way. Uh, lots of time for questions because I'm gonna hit on some of the, uh, the more, um, say popular, but more damaging insects that people encounter. Um, everybody has their own little um, things, ecosystems in their backyard, so anybody has any questions on anything we didn't cover, by all means. Okay, so there's my circle. See, there is a circle. There's the uh, pine scale, mealybugs, and woolly aphids. They all, at first glance, look pretty much identical, but they're different insects. Uh, this is a problem people come up with, and it's soot mold, and it's caused by uh, insects not by a fungus. So the fungus grows on the honeydew that's caused by an insect that's sucking on the plant. So we're gonna start off with the spongy moth. If nobody's ever heard of that, don't be surprised. The name was changed last week from uh, a name that was changed about a month ago. So the gypsy moth, as we've all known it, and uh, has been quite uh, severe in the last few years. Uh, apparently gypsy moths were um, not politically correct, so we're now calling them spongy moths. I saw my first uh, one yesterday, so they have just hatched. Uh, the way they spread through our landscape is the egg masses are now hatching. The tiny caterpillars will climb to the top of whatever they're hatched on, which could be your house, your telephone pole, or a tree. 
they send out a small thread and the wind will pick them up and they balloon across the environment. They can go as far as a kilometer. So that's why you'll see these things you know, on your patio umbrella or on your car and you're going, how did they ever get there? So they get blown through the wind. So even if you didn't have any eggs on your plants, you can still get gypsy moths on pretty much everything. So uh, usually in the start of the season, which is would have been you know a couple weeks ago, you can be scouting for and removing egg masses. The egg masses are a beige cottony mass on the side of the tree that the uh, the female moth will lay the eggs and then put like a silk webbing over top of them. And so the first step would be to remove as much of the egg masses as possible. Uh, you can also use horticultural oil to spray them, especially if they're higher and up out of reach. Um, and then banding the trees. So you can band your trees right now. So what, what happens is because the caterpillars are spread by the wind, now they're gonna have to go and find a tree to climb up and start to eat. So if we do a banding around it with burlap or with a product called Tango Foot, which is a sticky goop that catches them, we can stop them from getting up the trees. Uh, they also, when you get a really hot day, they will come down on their uh, silk and then uh, to get into the shade, avoid the heat of the day, and then they'll climb back up to feed at night. So the banding is a really effective way to keep them out of your trees. It's not, of course, 100%. Uh, the other product that we do have available is called BTK. It's a biological insecticide. It's one of the few products that we still have left that we can use. The cities and municipalities actually use this and are doing helicopter spraying probably in the next couple of weeks. Uh, anybody who's around here in Burlington, uh, even Mount Forest Park, uh, and LaSalle Park gets sprayed by helicopters right in the city. So the product is very, very safe. It only affects caterpillars and it's a stomach toxin. They eat it and they will die in a few days. They um, don't drop dead immediately like anybody who's familiar with some of the older pesticides that we used to use, but they typically stop feeding almost right away. The other thing with these biological insecticides, if you see the red and blue spots on their back, you're too late. So they only work on the first couple instars, which is probably up to about three quarters of an inch long. So you can't dally and wait until they get big and you see them. You have to be out there scouting and looking and, and making sure you protect your plants. The moths will then, the caterpillars will grow big and then they will pupate, they will become moths. The female moths are flightless, so they will climb back up the tree and uh, the males will fly around and they'll all get together and they'll lay their egg masses in usually mid to late summer. So again, the cycle starts again, and as soon as you see the moths or the egg masses at any time, you can remove and destroy those. The hydrangea leaf rollers, uh, has anybody noticed a little tenting on the end of the, so normally it's uh, Incredible or uh, Annabelle hydrangeas are the ones that are most susceptible, so these are the round white ball ones. There's a little caterpillar goes in there, he also has a little silk thread that he spins a little web and he pulls the leaves together and makes a tent. Uh, almost impossible to get in there and get them out, so you either can prune them out, you can open up the tents and pull out the caterpillar and squish them, or drop them into a bucket of soapy water. Uh, hydrangeas are pretty fast growing, so if you just go in and as soon as you see them, cut them off and prune them is probably the fastest and easiest way to deal with them. There is only one generation per season uh, and they usually come out right after the leaves are fully expanded and the buds are just starting to form and they will close up around a bud and that's what they're gonna be feeding on. So try and get them as uh, soon as you see them. Uh, the beetles and the grubs. So there's really three types of grubs that do damage in our gardens. The biggest one that we have around here is the Japanese beetle. And they have a one year life cycle. The adults will be coming out uh, generally around June. They fly around and mate. The adults will also feed on your plants. They then lay their eggs back in the soil in July and they hatch in August and start all over again. The best time to control these as a larva in your soil is to apply um, a BT product again. This is another biological product. It only came out a couple years ago. And you can apply that in July or early August and that controls the entire life cycle. You get them when they're small and actively feeding, then you don't have any problems the next spring. In the spring right now, they're really hard to kill. So there's not really anything that's gonna be effective for their control. The skunks and raccoons are coming and digging up people's lawns looking for the grubs. 
and uh, there's not a heck of a lot we can do about that. Sometimes the animal repellents work to keep the skunks and raccoons away, but uh, keep an eye out for the beetles when they come out because they'll start eating things like roses and fruit trees and some of your specimen trees in your property. There's a couple ways we can deal with the adults. There's a trap that we have that has a pheromone scented lure. If you're using traps, always remember to put the traps downwind from where your plants you're protecting so that if the trap is attracting the bugs, they're gonna get to the trap before they get to your plants. If you put the trap upwind, then they're gonna follow the scent, they're gonna find your plants before they ever get to the, the plants. The other, the other trick that I like is you uh, be a good neighbor and you buy them for your neighbors and you don't put any on your property. Uh, there is a new product that just came out this year that can uh, help us with the control of the adults. It's the same uh, type of biological product we use for the uh, larva in the soil, but this is a wettable powder, it's a spray. So unfortunately the insecticides that we have available for use today primarily are things like pyrethrins and insecticidal soap that are only effective when you spray them directly on the insect that you're trying to control. So that doesn't work very good on a tree and that doesn't work very good because you have to go out and do it all the time. The advantage of this uh, new um, product, the wettable powder, it's called Beetle Be Gone. The advantage is it'll stay on the plant for several days and when they come and feed on the foliage, they will ingest the biological product. And again, it'll take a couple days to die but they generally stop feeding almost right away. Junebug has a three year life cycle so they will spend an entire summer feeding on the grass of the roots of your grass. Normally the damage shows up in the summertime. As soon as you get some hot dry weather, uh, the grass will start to die in patches. Generally speaking, it's the sunniest spots on your lawn that get the most damage because the grass is the most stressed there and can't recover as fast. Usually in the shade, the, the, the grubs are still there, but they don't tend to do a lot of, as much damage. They can also be in your gardens and eating the roots of your plants in your gardens as well, but typically it's the lawns that suffer from the damage. Nematodes for grubs are, can be effective, but they are very difficult to use. So you're using a live organism to go after another live organism. The, the challenge with the nematodes is that they cannot live in the sun. Uh, what you have to do is you have to wet the lawn first. So you gotta go pre-water your lawn for probably about a half an hour. Then you can apply the nematodes. Then you got to come back and put the sprinkler on for another hour after that. And you have to keep the lawn moist for the next two or three days so they have a chance to get down into the soil. Um, if they're left on the surface for any length of time, the uh, UV rays from the sun will, will kill the nematodes. The, um, the granular Grub Be Gone product, the biological, uh, has a lot more uh, longer lasting. It'll last for months in the soil. Uh, it needs to be watered in, but it doesn't need to be watered in immediately. It's not like the, you know, it's gonna, uh, like the nematodes will die right away. Boxwood leaf miner. So everybody usually has a couple boxwoods, little hedges, a few little specimen plants around. Uh, this bug's been around for probably about 10 years now, and leaf miner means that he is in between the upper and lower leaf surface. It's very hard to get to the larva when they're feeding in there and insecticide will not touch them. So what we have to do is we have to try and control the adult before they lay their eggs. The adult, as you can see on that little leaf there, is it looks like a mosquito, except he's orange. They are very poor flyers and they will be flying just above the boxwoods. Now fortunately, the adults are very easy to control and even insecticidal soap will take them out. So usually, um, when the wajilias bloom is the time to start looking for the adults, and that's gonna be late May. So if you have a boxwood, just go out and look right over the top, and when you see them starting, these uh, adults starting to fly, that's when you wanna control them and knock them out before they can lay their eggs. The other thing is once you have all the new growth is kind of flushed out, normally boxwoods are pruned anyway, so you wanna give them a pruning and you can prune away the larvae will be uh, usually hatching in the newest growth. So that's what you're gonna prune back a little bit of that and you can get rid of some of the, uh, the larvae feeding that way. Scale insects. So this is part of the, one of the sucking insect families. So they don't, they don't do damage by chewing on the leaves like the beetles and the caterpillars. They actually will suck the juices from the plants which causes the plants to can turn yellow and they can start to wither in the new uh, foliage and buds can look uh, twisted and distorted. 
They are, um, there's different types of scale insects. They are typically, uh, they don't jump from one plant to another. So one of these, like a magnolia scale, will not get on your euonymus and vice versa. They're fairly plant specific, the different types of scales. So they have a protective shell, so they're very hard to control with a insecticide. They have a crawler stage, so the, uh, the females will lay eggs underneath the shell and then the, uh, the, when the babies hatch, the nymphs, they can crawl out from underneath the shell and they can spread around and find their own place. And as they start to mature, they'll create their own uh, shell over top of them. So the, the crawler stage is the easiest to control, but they all have a different life cycle. So again, we're talking, doing a little bit of research um, and you can find out when they're at their crawler stage to control them. The, um, the easiest way to control them though on pretty much all your plants is to do a dormant spray. So before the leaves uh, emerge, before the buds open up, the plants are still dormant, we can use a product called horticultural oil and the oil will smother a lot of insects, insect eggs and prevent problems later on in the year. So this is March or April, you're gonna use, you can use a dormant spray. We're a little past that now. Most of the plants are all budding and leafing out. But when you're talking about a dormant spray, you can actually use a higher strength of the horticultural oil, which is far more effective. You can also use horticultural oil in season on woody ornamentals, but you use it as a lower rate. It's not quite as effective, but if you have a problem you're trying to control, you may need a couple applications throughout the year. Uh, quite often when they're dead, the eels, they won't fall off, but you can touch them with your fingernail and scrape them and they'll fall off and, they'll, and you can see that they're, they're been controlled. The euonymus scale looks like a tiny little white fleck and they'll be usually on the stem and the underside of the leaf. Oh, the other thing with the uh, scale insects is because they're a sucking insect, they produce a honeydew, as do the aphids. Aphids are also called plant lice. They can appear in huge numbers very, very quickly. They're very small. They're going to be generally attacking the newest foliage and the flower buds. And they come in the hundreds and they will appear like alien invasion overnight. Um, they can be black, they can be gray, they can be green. Uh, there's also a woolly variation. They are fortunately fairly easy to control with something like insecticidal soap. But again, remember insecticidal soap leaves no residue on the plant. It will only kill what you spray it on. So if you're using it, come back after a couple days and see how uh, effective it was and you may need, probably gonna need to do another application because there'll be another hatching, there'll be some you missed. And so to get rid of the problem, you have to do it at least more than once. Uh, spider mites, another sucking insect. You're rarely going to ever see these. They are quite tiny. Uh, normally, you'll notice them because they also excrete a honeydew. Uh, so you ever seen a sticky substance on your plant or, you know, you get them on your house plants and you might find it on the floor underneath the plant. The um, interesting thing with some of these sucking insects, there's other insects will actually harvest those insects and move them around. Ants have been known to move around aphids on the different parts of the plants because the, what they want is the honeydew. So it's almost like they're farming aphids. The uh, spider mites also come in uh, green, red, and black. The easiest way to identify them, other if you don't see the stickiness or the webbing, is you take a piece of paper and you hold it under a branch and you give that branch a sharp wrap and they will fall onto the piece of paper. They will look to be about the size of a speck of pepper and they're probably going to be moving. So you've all probably seen clover mites, which are those little tiny red ones. You see them on the side of buildings when it gets uh, warm and sunny. Again, insecticidal soap is about the best we have for most of these controls. So the insects generally are late May. Most of them will come out in late May and that's when you want to start looking for them. Um, but so keep your notes and, and keep your, uh, your eyes open.